Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. My name is Duffy Robbins, and uh, let me just say to everybody here, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, delighted to have you here. If you're visiting, uh, it's, just, it's just good to see. It's always a joy for me to come uh, to be with you here at, uh, at Faith Bridge. I was with my, um, my brother and his wife in our hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina, about two weeks ago, and um, we were talking about um, our parents and, and, and gifts they had given us over the years. Um, and, and especially because it's Christmas time and, you know, we're thinking about, well, they gave us uh, Davy Crockett coon stinkin hats and, uh, and they gave us this unbelievable thing. You have to see it to believe it. It was called Pong. And, uh, and, and then uh, they, uh, my dad gave me my first Elvis Presley record and, uh, and, and, and I think it was my last. But, but, uh, but, but one of the things my brother and I agreed on is that, that my parents, one of the greatest gifts they gave us was that we grew up in a home where there was a lot of laughter. It was just a ton of laughter. And my mom and dad weren't big pranksters and they weren't big, you know, joke tellers. I mean, they certainly enjoyed a good joke. But, but my mom and dad did have a gift of, of seeing uh, humor even in the everyday stuff of life. Even in those kind of uh, hard nook and cranny moments where it's kind of hard to see uh, much humor at all. I, I remember um, the last 10 years of my uh, mom's life, she suffered from Alzheimer's disease. Not a lot of uh, laughter and fun and humor there. Um, and, and I can still remember that um, the way we would do it is when I would fly through Charlotte, um, my dad would bring my mom out to the airport so I could visit with her and him uh, while I made my connection to the next flight. And, and because uh, I fly American Airlines, I flew through Charlotte a lot. And, and, um, and I remember one time dad called me uh, before I... Uh, got down there and he said, uh, I don't know when your next trip to Charlotte is, but I just want to warn you the next time you come to town, Duff, I want to give you a little bit of a heads up that, that, that mom has lost a lot since your last visit and, and, uh, and, and she, might, she might not recognize you, which is almost impossible to imagine your mom, you know, not recognizing you. And I honestly don't think I thought that much about it. Um, my next trip was about three weeks later, get on the plane, come down to Charlotte, um, between connections, I go out security and, uh, and sure enough, there's my mom and dad. And by this time she just bone thin and I went over to hug her. When I went up to hug her, she looked right past me, just this vacant gaze right past me. And when I actually hugged her, she hit me and said, shut up. Just that, just shut up. My dad goes, she remembers you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it was kind of an awesome moment, I think, because, because you, 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 my dad wasn't saying in that moment, we don't care that mom's sick, you know, we're not going to pretend like this is some kind of good thing and that, that we're glad uh, that this has happened. Uh, my dad loved my mom passionately just to the last hours of her life. But I think what he was saying was this, he was saying, look, this is painful. This is painful, and we're not trying to ignore here what is a really hard situation right in front of us. But neither are we going to stop living. Neither are we going to stop loving in this family. We're not going to stop pursuing life together. We're not going to accept that, that pain and, and loss are the final victors here. I think he was saying, look, this, this is tough. This is hard. There have been tough days behind us, and there are going to be tough days ahead but don't think for a minute, don't even think for a minute that we are finished with laughter. Don't think for a minute we're finished with laughter. I, I, I suspect that a lot of us in the room uh, this morning, that, that may in some ways uh, be your story, at least to some extent. I, I, I think probably a lot of us in this room, as you look back on 2017, Pastor Ken sort of alluded to this in his prayer. It, it, you may very well be saying, man, that, that was a hard time. That was a tough year, and the year ahead, frankly, doesn't look a whole heck of a lot better. You know, it's interesting. The last time I was here at Faith Bridge was Sunday morning, August 13th. Sunday morning, August 13th. And I preached that morning from Ephesians chapter 4. Not that I think you've forgotten. And I preached that morning. It's not funny. Uh, I preached that morning in Ephesians chapter 4. I talked about the unity of the church. Uh, I call it uh, an eager oneness. 
And in that sermon, I actually use an illustration from uh, World War II, the evacuation at Dunkirk, uh, during which uh, this, uh, this uh, group of British citizens, basically, in this ragtag armada of, of fishing uh, vessels and, and pleasure boats, uh, rescued almost 339,000 troops from the clutches uh, of the German army. And I suggested that, mo- that morning that, that maybe what God was calling us to do at Faith Bridge was to sort of mount this, this rescue operation, that we would sort of be a holy flotilla, uh, a community of people who would, 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 would try to mount the rescue of folks in our communities, our friends who are, who are uh, oppressed uh, by the enemy and need to be rescued. Well, of course, uh, I never meant that sermon to be prophetic, uh, you know, or, or, or to be some kind of prediction. Uh, never in my wildest imagination uh, would I have guessed that 12 days later, 12 days later, August 25th, 2017, a Category 4 storm was going to blow in here to Texas, make that Faith Bridge Dunkirk evacuation seem like a literal possibility. And of course, you all know the story better than I. There were two feet of rain that fell in 24 hours at its peak on September 1st. 70% of the 1,800 square miles of Harris County were covered in a foot and a half of water. Uh, Flooding forced uh, 39,000 people out of their homes into shelters. 203,000 homes were damaged. 12,700 damaged beyond repair. Uh, There there were $180 billion in damage, uh, more than any other natural disaster in the history of the United States. And and, and let me just stop there to say this too, that, that because I haven't really seen you guys since Harvey. Um, I want you to know that, you know, I live 1,500 miles away in Pennsylvania, and yet during that hurricane, I was absolutely riveted at watching the Faith uh, Bridge Facebook posts and, 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 and joining in on that, that amazing uh, Wednesday night prayer uh, service and, and just on the phone and texting with Pastor Ken. Uh, but, but what really blew me away the most was the way this Faith Bridge community uh, stepped up to quite literally just um, dive in and make an impact uh, on the recovery effort. It was, it was stunning to watch it and, and to see. I remember my, one of my favorite uh, announcements during that uh, time period was uh, the Faith Bridge Facebook uh, page actually had an announcement about sheet rock classes for Faith Bridge members. So that you could go out and do, you know, service projects and you could go out and help your neighbor. Sheet rock. I and mean, I've thought about, you know, I've heard a lot of church announcements, uh, you know, Sunday school classes. We need more kindergarten teachers. Uh, there's some Bible study. Oh yeah. And we're going to do sheet rock. Class. And uh, it's like, okay, right. I've heard feed my sheep, but this, you know, use my sheet rock. And, and uh, it was just awesome. It was, it was honestly very inspiring, but I don't think anybody in this room would deny those were tough times. They were tough times. And I think thinking back on 2017, a lot of us this morning would say, yeah, though there have been some really hard times behind us. And then of course, uh, as if that weren't enough, there are all of the other awful headlines that uh, have invaded in the past year, right? There's the mass shootings, and the terrorist uh, attacks and the, the nuclear threat from North Korea and the, and the ugliness of the, of the, um, political combat and the daily scandal of sexual harassment and assault and massive wildfires in California and, and the opioid uh, epidemic. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's discouraging, isn't it? I mean, it? I mean, in fact, you know what? Let's just close in prayer. No, but it, it is, it's discouraging. You know, you, you start to read these headlines, you start to hear this stuff and you go, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and guess what? If that's not bad enough, Star Wars is, is, is a lousy movie and Apple is sabotaging our phones. And, and, and so it just seems like the story gets worse and worse. There have been tough days behind us and they're very likely gonna be tough days ahead, which makes, I think, even more intriguing the passage of scripture we're going to read this morning from God's word. But what we're going to see in the next few minutes on this New Year's Eve morning is that in the grim face of the days ahead and, and, and the hard realities of the days behind us, there is a very real hope. Hear this, a very real hope of gladness. 
of Gladys, that, that we're all invited. Every one of us in this room, we're invited to trust in a God who takes laughter, laughter very seriously. Uh, if you have a Bible this morning, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. If you don't have a Bible, if you just shoot your hand up in the air, we have some folks that would love to give one to you. They're coming down the aisle. Just put your hand up in the air. We can see it, and uh, we'll make sure that you get one. If you're not used to reading the Bible, it's kind of a new thing for you. That's great. We're glad you're here. All you have to do to find Psalm 126 is to open your Bible and then close it, and then open it again right smack in the middle. And you will be in the book of Psalms and then just make your way over to Psalm 126. We're going to start reading in verse 1. Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Sometimes when I'm speaking to parents uh, for parenting seminars, uh, I talk to them about what I call the principle of faithful laughter. The principle of faithful laughter. And the principle of faithful laughter simply says this, that, that, that laughter is sometimes one of the clearest marks of serious faith. Laughter is one of the clearest marks of serious faith. We want to communicate faith to our children. Sometimes it is best communicated through laughter. Um, I remember my, my daughters uh, would travel with me a lot over the years until uh, they you know, went to college and, and got married. And, and, uh, and, and because I am the only male in this family with uh, three other women, uh, whenever we'd go swimming or something like that, I would have to go into the bathroom to put on my bathing suit. The women uh, would have free range. And, and, uh, and I remember we were one afternoon, we were in a hotel room, we were going to go swimming. And so I stepped there into the bathroom to put on my bathing suit while I'm in the bathing, while I'm in the bathroom. I noticed one of my wife's bathing suits hanging on that hook on the back of the door. And I don't know what got into me, but I decided I'm going to put that puppy on. <clears throat> I won't say it was easy. And it no longer fits her. <laughs> and there are photos on the Faith Bridge Facebook page. That's not true. Um, but you know what was interesting? Now, I put this thing on and kind of, you know, step out of the bathroom. Next thing you know, it's just like absolute pandemonium. Shrieks and screams. And, and my younger daughter still tears up when we mention swimming. But, but, but you know what's funny is, you know, is that, is that, oh, uh, we were talking about this. We were talking about this one night at dinner and my wife and my daughters were talking about what is it that we celebrate about our family? What did you love? And my older daughter said, I like the way we laugh together. And the event she recounted was the day dad put on mom's bathing suit. And I said, remember, sweetheart, that's something we just talk about as a family. Uh, be difficult for daddy's career. But, but, uh, but it reminded me again of this truth that, that, that laughter is a, a very, very clear mark, I think, of serious faith. Um, this Psalm 126, at its heart, is this stunning phrase, our mouths were filled with laughter. Our mouths were filled with laughter. And to understand this, this sort of surprising laughter in Psalm 126, we have to understand something about the backstory of this particular psalm. It's a psalm that is really told uh, us uh, through two vivid images, one from the past, one from the future. Uh, let's begin with the past uh, in verse 1. Look at the text. We'll begin with the past in verse 1. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion... We were like those who dream. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. The psalmist begins this psalm in verse 1, recounting essentially with one verse what is almost 500 years of Israel's history. And if you know anything about Israel's history, if you know anything about that history, uh, you would know it has not been a happy story. 
uh, the fortunes of Zion, the nation of Israel, have had a very tough go of it. Nobody would have predicted that laughter would be a prominent part uh, of the soundtrack. Uh, when King Solomon died in, in 931 BC, uh, the kingdom of Israel split into two parts. There was uh, Judah, which was down south, uh, and then there was Israel, which is also called Samaria, uh, up in the north. And, and this division between the south and the north uh, led to all kinds of political and, and, and frankly, spiritual uh, turmoil. The people of God's covenant promise uh, became a people just decimated by wars and by idolatry. It was, it was, it was ugly. And then just when everybody thought it couldn't get any worse, in 726 B.C., the Assyrian Empire came down and conquered the northern kingdom, uh, captured 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, and took them all back to Assyria to be slaves, to live in slavery, to be their oppressions, to be their oppressors, and, and to live there uh, in exile. And, and then in 586 BC, that same sort of devastation and destruction came from the armies of Babylon against the people. In, uh, in Judah. Now, all of a sudden, they find their temple in Jerusalem destroyed. Uh, they, they, they do this forced march all the way back to, to Babylonia, and it's just a mess, and it's a horrible history. Uh, to put it bluntly, uh, there just wasn't a whole lot of laughter uh, among the people of God. But then something remarkable happened. Something stunning happened. By 538 BC, the Persians had conquered Babylonia. And so to everyone's complete surprise, Cyrus the Great, who was the king of Persia, he actually issued a decree that the Israelites would be released from their slavery. They would be returned to their homeland. And, and the psalmist describes this in verse one as being like a, a dream come true. In fact, uh, even the neighboring nations, look at verse two, said, uh, you know, holy cow, what, what what just happened to them? The Lord has done great things for them. And you can see there in verse three that the people of Israel said, you're not kidding. Uh, the Lord has done great things for us and we're glad. So that, that's the story from the past. But then in Psalm 26, our attention is directed to the future. Look back at verse four in the text. The psalmist turns his attention from the past to the future. Notice verse one is the Lord restored, past tense, testimony of what God has done. And, and then in verse four, restore our fortunes, O Lord, a petition for what God might do, what God might do in the future. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Now, um, I need to explain that phrase briefly, the streams in the Negev, because that's a reference uh, to a pattern of seasonal flooding uh, that happens every year uh, in the deserts of southern Israel. Uh, when the landscape, uh, which has been scarred by wind and erosion, uh, all begins to sort of form this network of, of, of ditches. And then all of a sudden, uh, there are spring floods that, that just begin to fill them. They come alive with, with gushing water and literally causes the desert to just erupt and blossom into, into color and, and life. It's, it's an image that almost suggests uh, that the desert is just kind of bursting itself into laughter. It's an amazing experience. But then in verse five, look back at the text, you can see the psalmist shifts from a meteorological kind of metaphor to an agricultural metaphor. Verse five, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So in verse four, uh, the psalmist gives us kind of this image of a barren, empty landscape that all of a sudden just blooms into this surprising uh, fullness and, and life. In verses five and six, uh, the psalmist uses the image of a, of a, of a hopeful uh, farmer who, who sows with tears and with discouragement and with weeping and with sweat, but someday knows he will reap with shouts of joy. So you can see that in both of the images, there's a trajectory from despair to hope, from barrenness to, to joy. It's a short Psalm, this Psalm, Psalm 126, but I think you can see as you read these words and hear the story that it's a story written by a guy who knows what it's like 
to face pain, to face difficulty. He knows what it's like to see some tough days behind him. It's also written by a guy, though, who, who knows what it's like to be so surprised by the joyful uh, faithfulness of God, even in the midst of the bad stuff, that it just makes him want to throw his head back and laugh. It just makes him want to laugh. And I think what this psalm does is it gives us a, a very vivid picture of what I would describe as, as faithful laughter. It's kind of a primer on faithful laughter. This psalm points us to a God who, uh, even in the toughest of times, offers us the possibility, offers you and me the possibility of laughter and promise and hopeful joy. This is a psalm that says, we're not done yet. We're not done yet with laughter. Now, looking back at the year that maybe some of us have had, or perhaps even some of the questions and issues and fears we have about the year ahead, the obvious question is, how can that be? How can we actually believe that? How can we stand here on the threshold of a new year and face it with any sense of promise and hope? Well, let me make two very, very simple observations. Two very simple observations. The first one is this. When you read Psalm 126, you begin to realize that, that it is sometimes in the midst of our problems that God, that God does his most beautiful work. That sometimes it's in the midst of our problems that God does his most beautiful work. Now, I know nothing about photography, okay? I think in my entire life, I've probably uh, posted four pictures on Instagram, uh, and, and I only use Snapchat so I can make funny faces for my granddaughter, and, and, and frankly, my arm's not quite long enough to do a selfie of my entire face. Uh, so yeah, again, that's not funny, but, 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 but I have a buddy who's kind of a photography geek, right? You know the type. He's, he's got all the gear. He's got the lights, He's got the camera with the lens that like juts out about seven feet. He's got, uh, he's got everything you possibly need. And he actually has down in the basement of his house a dark room, a dark room. He took me down there one day in the dark room and, and, uh, and by the, just the dim light, the faint light, this one red little bulb, he began to explain to me about uh, the importance of the dark room, that it was critical for developing these dull gray negatives into vivid, sharp, full color pictures. It's an absolutely essential part of the process because the way he explained it, the, the pictures happen when, when the film is exposed to light, but the colors happen, the focus happen, the negatives are developed in darkness. And I wonder this morning as you think about your negatives and think about how easy it is for us to think that the key to happiness is avoiding the negatives, to stay out of the dark places. You see, what the psalmist wants us to understand in Psalm 126 is that sometimes it takes the dark places, the places of exile, the places of, of loneliness, the places of, of hardship and discouragement and, and sweat and despair and weeping to bring out the most vivid and beautiful colors. Because, because I think you would agree, in our culture, it's sort of the default response, the default response to, uh, to, to happiness, the default approach to uh, happiness in our culture is very simple. We want to eliminate the negatives and try to avoid the dark places altogether, right? So we, we numb the pain, we, we protect ourselves from, from disappointments. The standard approach to happiness uh, in, in, in pretty much our lives is, is to go to a beach, uh, you know, go to a warm place, go to a show, uh, get a big bank account, uh, uh, watch a cat video, uh, you know, go to a movie, uh, go out for dinner, and then complete your joy uh, by posting announcements of your good fortune on Facebook or Instagram. And, and of course, I'm not saying that any of that stuff is bad or that it's necessarily evil, except for maybe the cat video which I think is inherently satanic. But, 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 but Psalm 126 reminds us that God can invite us to plunge deeper, deeper into those dark places because that's where God can begin to take our negatives at work, in our family, with school stuff, whatever it is, physical ailments, God can take those negatives and in that dark place somehow transform even those into places of vivid color. See, Psalm 126 invites us to plunge deeper, 
to go deeper. It's interesting, one of the quirks about the New Testament, if you begin to study the New Testament, is that you will almost always notice that suffering is hardly ever mentioned without also a mention of some kind of blessing from suffering. That every time you hear suffering mentioned, it's usually mentioned with the promise of blessing. And guess which blessing is most often promised in the context of suffering? It's the blessing of joy. The blessing of joy. It's counterintuitive. But actually, if you go through the New Testament, there are at least 18 different places in the New Testament where suffering and joy are, are actually found right there, side by side. Let's, um, let's uh, slip over just a minute to Romans chapter five. You don't have to look it up. We'll, we'll put it up on the screen. Romans chapter five, verse two to five. Paul writes these words. Look at this. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoiced in hope of the glory of God. Notice that. We rejoiced in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, and, and that, that that's not, not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Some translations render it, hope does not disappoint us. In other words, you will not be made a sucker. You will not be made a sucker for hoping in God because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Us. Psalm 126 reminds us we can laugh. Even in the dark places, because we know God is at work. Even there. Even there. That, that sometimes in the midst of our problems, God does his most beautiful work. That's observation number one. Observation number two is this faithful laughter, faithful laughter comes not in the absence of problems, but in the presence of faith. Faithful laughter comes not in the absence of problems, but in the presence of faith. J.R. Tolkien, uh, the author of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, uh, calls this eucatastrophe. Eucatastrophe, literally the good catastrophe. Uh, eucatastrophe, the good catastrophe, it's when something bad happens, but that bad thing that happens actually makes a good thing even better. It's a eucatastrophe. And he actually cites that this is, this is actually the core of the story of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. It's, it's the eucatastrophe where something bad happens, but that bad thing that happens makes something good even better. And I, I know it's, a, it's kind of a, it's counterintuitive to think this way. I'm going to give you a simple illustration. It's kind of dumb, but maybe it'll help you to understand what he means by this. Um, uh, you see on the screen here a, a picture um, uh, it's uh, actually uh, me uh, with a rented Jeep up on a mountaintop in the Southern Rockies. Uh, I'm near Columbine Pass, uh, near Durango, Colorado. You can see there, it was a beautiful day, sunny, bright. Uh, I was exploring these peaks and these passes and the high mountains. Um, it, was, it was gorgeous, it was awesome. I, I, was, I was very, very happy until approximately one hour after this photograph was taken. Because that's when I drove across a snow field on top of one of those peaks and got stuck right in the middle of the snow field without chains, without a shovel, and without a cell signal. And now, of course, uh, being male, at first I tried to go, this will be an adventure. And, and, and I thought, that's okay, I'll MacGyver myself out of this. And so I tried to rig up something with the guidebook and the tire iron, and that was a disaster. That, that pretty much ruined the guidebook and made my hands uh, pretty much painfully cold. And that's when I finally realized, you know what? You're stuck. You are stuck. Welcome, stuck person, uh, to this stuck, like, you know, to the snowfield. I mean, I'm helpless. Unless, unless maybe uh, somebody comes up the same trail I come, I'm, I'm going to be here for I don't know how long. And that's when I began to contemplate wonder what it would be like to spend the night up here in this Jeep. 
uh, what, what it might be like uh, not to make it time uh, to give the keynote message at the conference I was speaking at. Uh, what it might be like to explain to my wife, yes, I, I did make the trip by myself. Uh, what it might be like uh, to have to leave the Jeep up there and hike down and explain to the guy that rented me the Jeep that his Jeep was on a mountain, but I'm safe. Isn't that good? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and imagine what it might be like to pay the extra uh, days of rental. And, and, uh, and, and it's interesting, you know, I, 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 I don't know about you, but I mean, I, I I, there was a point I was going like, oh my gosh, Lord, Lord, don't you understand? I need to get off of this mountain so I can preach your word and serve you and be warm and have dinner and not pay extra rental charges. And, 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 I, and I, I mean, there was, there was a little bit of that, but there was also this sense, and this is going to sound kind of weird. I don't think I'm over-spiritualizing, but there was also a sense in which, frankly, more than I felt bewilderment, I felt bemusement. I'm like, wow, wow, this is fascinating. Uh, you know, Lord, how in the world, how in the world are you going to get me out of this? And, 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 and you can imagine God going, well, how did you get into this? But, but, but you know, it's, I have this sense that God would somehow come to my rescue. And sure enough, it took four hours Four hours, these three guys come up the trail on ATVs, hook me up their tow line easily, just pull me right out of the snow, and I begin to embrace them and weep like a small baby. But, but uh, <clears throat> here's the important part of the story. As happy and as joyful as I was in that first picture near Columbine Pass, it wasn't anything like the joy and the laughter you would have witnessed if you'd seen a picture of me <laughs> taken about five hours later when I was pulled out of the snow. In other words, in other words, this is important. The anxiety and the stress and the disappointment of being stuck in the snow actually heightened my joy for the rest of the journey. That's that's you catastrophe. You know, like I thought about what happened and about how grateful I was for my rescue, and my mouth was filled with laughter. My mouth was filled with laughter. Now here's why that's important on this New Year's Eve, because your ability my ability to see hope and joy and laughter in our present is gonna be shaped by our willingness and ability to see how God has worked in our past, even in the hardest of times. It's about choosing to recognize there is a bigger story and, 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 and that God is at work in the midst of that story. Even when you don't have any idea where the story's going or how in the world you actually step into this story or where this story is going to end, you don't know any of that. What you know is this, faithful laughter comes by reminding ourselves, even in the midst of life's badness, about the absolute certainty of God's goodness, of God's goodness, no matter what. Because ours is the God of the eucatastrophe. Faithful laughter comes not in the absence of problems, but in the presence of truth. I have a buddy who's a youth worker in Sri Lanka. His name is Ajit Fernando. And Ajit tells a story about the death of his very best friend. He died of cancer back in 2005. And he said that by the time he was admitted to the hospital, for the very last time, he was in excruciating pain. He was, he was uh, just hurting and, and, and gradually slipping into and out of consciousness. And Ajit said one of the last things his buddy said to him before he died was this. He, he recalled a testimony they had heard from somebody who was in a similar situation. And his buddy said to Ajit, he said, Ajit, I have hit, I have surely hit rock bottom. But here's what I've discovered. I found out that the rock is solid. The rock is solid. See, that's the, that's the triumph of faithful laughter. It comes not in the absence of problems, but in the presence of faith. I don't know if you saw this uh, little meme that was circling around in cyberspace a couple of weeks before Christmas. It, it, was, uh, it was kind of fun to look at. It was sort of an optical illusion. It, it really was based on kind of two different pictures. And some of you may have seen it, maybe you didn't. Uh, picture number one is the image that you see on the screen. It's, uh, it's picture of the manger, bright star above in the night 
time sky, and you got Joseph and Mary on either side, baby Jesus, savior of the world in the middle, right there in the crib. That's picture number one. Picture number two is the exact same picture. Exact same picture, but some people observe that if you look at the picture a certain way, you won't see a manger, you won't see Mary and Joseph for Jesus. What you will see instead are two dinosaurs fighting over a buzzsaw. I'm going to give you a minute. Just a look. Just look at it. Two dinosaurs. I have ruined Christmas. Yes. Just call me Pastor Grinch. If you can't spot it, we'll try to help you out. Take a look. We'll see if this makes a little more sense. Yeah, there, there it is right there. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the three wise men gave them gifts of, of live animals. But, 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 but it's interesting because, you know, when people looked at it, they go, well, I don't see it. Some saw one picture, some saw the other picture. Here's why I mentioned this this morning. Because what I am hoping, what I am hoping we can understand this morning is that in a very deep way, Psalm 126 wants to put before us two different pictures, two different images, two different ways of looking at life. One that ushers us into lasting joy, even in the midst of tough times, and the other that pushes us into this lifelong pursuit of happiness and good times in the hopes of finding, hopefully, joy. Jesus actually described it as two ways. Uh, or two gates, or two, two, two roads. One leads to life, the other leads to death. And in very clear and unique terms, Jesus said, the gateway to that life begins with me. It begins with me. John 14, 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Now, what that means for every one of us here in this room this morning, young, old, married, single, members, visitors, is that it really does come down. At the end of the day, it really does come down to what we see in that manger. It really does come down to how we see Jesus. You see, what we have in Psalm 126 is really nothing more than one of the many signposts in Scripture that tell us the same surprising story. That all of us are lost. All of us are exiled from our heart's true home. All of us are separated from God by our sin and by our stubborn refusal to admit we are stuck. We are unable to rescue ourselves. And that God, in an act of, of surprising rescue, sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven and that we might be brought back into his household, which is our true home. And this rescue... And that this rescue does not come by our will. It doesn't come by our own goodness or our own little kind of religious MacGyverism where we kind of create some little deal. It comes only by a stunning decree of the king of all kings. And this morning, on the tail end of this old year and on the front end of a new year, I want to invite you to bow with me before that king. I want to invite you to look back at the year that's gone by and recognize that you have not been abandoned. Even in the midst of the darkness, even in the midst of the storms and all the negatives, that there's a God who pursues us and surprises us with mercy and with grace. Like an empty field, like an empty field that just bursts forth with fruit after showing very little promise of of harvest, Like like a desert that's been, been scarred and barren, but then wells up with beauty and with color and life. I get it. I get it. Maybe you're here this morning and you go, well, that's really hard. When I look back at what I've been through over the last year, when I look ahead at the challenges I'm facing in 2018, when I look at my marriage, when I look at my family, when I think about what's going on at my school and my friends and, and grades and the hassles there, and when I think about my health or I think about my job, it's hard. It's hard to embrace that. But Psalm 126 makes to us this promise, men and women, that if we will look to Jesus Christ, the King of all kings, if we will look to him by faith, someday there will come a day. We will look and we will see and we will know and we will understand. And our mouths, our mouths 
will be filled with laughter. I don't know what it feels like in your life this morning, but what God's word wants us to understand is we're not done with laughter. God invites us into the presence of his joy, even in the darkness. I'm going to ask you to bow your head as we close this morning. Because I know there's some of us in this room who have maybe never, ever gone to that manger and knelt at the foot of Jesus. And maybe, maybe today, before you launch into a new year, why not, why not give yourself to him? Why not bow before him? Why not, why not go for a new life instead of settling for just a new year? It doesn't happen by being good enough. It doesn't happen by being nice. It happens through his death on the cross and through asking him to forgive us for our sin, for our stubbornness, to rescue us from our selfishness so that we can know the eucatastrophe, the joy of being raised from the dead. Lord, you are a good and gracious God. I'm gonna pray this morning right now that you would be of my friends in this room that we might together begin to see this new year as a place where maybe now we see barrenness, maybe now we see ditches of discouragement. We might see by your grace and by your promise blossoms and color and fruit. And we might be surprised by your goodness. Lord, I pray today that you would help us to fall before you to recognize that there is still a God who's gracious and that laughter, we're not done. We're not done with laughter yet. Thank you, Lord. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hey, and welcome to Postscript. I am Kyle Pettit. I'm the young adult pastor here at FaithBridge, and I'm sitting here with Duffy Robbins, who just preached our last uh, sermon of 2017. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Uh, And so we have a few questions. One of them, the first one, um, one of somebody sent in is, how is one supposed to see the joy in the midst of sadness or despair if they're not familiar with God's goodness in the past? Yeah, first of all, thanks. Good to, good to be with you guys again, yeah, and uh, good to see you. We've, I think it's the first time we've done one of these podcasts It is. Uh, I, I, I have to say the contrast between me and <laughs> you, it's not funny, Kyle. But anyway, uh, no, it's, it's stark. But um, anyway, yeah, good question, good question. So how do we see the joy in the midst of sadness and despair when we're not really familiar or mm-hmm. don't feel that we're familiar with God's goodness? Um, you know, I, first of all, I totally get this. We've all felt this. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, I guess, I want to try to say there's nothing ugly or wrong about asking this question. And yet at the same time, what it, I think, betrays is, is sort of an, un, an inability to see um, that, in fact, we have all of us been benefactors of God's grace in ways we can't even imagine. Mm-hmm. I mean, whoever uh, wrote this question, just as an example, uh, wrote this question as a person who lives in a country where the standard of living is is quite a bit higher. And mm-hmm. so the fact that they have, uh, if they have a healthy body or that they have food, uh, that they have uh, a family that supports them and can care for them. I mean, these are blessings that we all take for granted. Uh, but but um, we take them for granted because they are so there, mm-hmm. and in places where they're not there, um, they 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 don't take them for granted. And so I think part of that is is not seeing um, even those even those um, blessings that are there every day. To me, it would be sort of like someone who is, you know, there's a I, years ago here at Faith Bridge in one of my sermons, I used this. Uh, this picture by a guy named George Seurat, a painting by mm-hmm. George Seurat, uh, S-E-R-A-T. He, uh, he did this painting that, that some of our um, 
listeners will ha be familiar with. It's called uh, Sunday Afternoon on the Island of Grand Ja. And, uh, and essentially what makes the picture remarkable is that he uses a, te a technique called pointeism. Pointeism, it's, it's literally taking your brush and instead of doing brush strokes, you just do points. Right. If you zoom in on the painting, if you zoom in on it, mm -hmm. uh, you will just see this kind of uh, discordant, uh, w without meaning, a section of dots mm -hmm. that seem to have no, they just seem to be randomly placed, they have mm -hmm. no meaning whatsoever. Um, it, when you come out, when you back out, you begin to realize, holy cow, all those little dots, they actually are telling a magnificent story that mm. I, I didn't even see. Yeah. I think this is, this, is, this is my response to this person, is that I think there are times for all of us when we look at the random moments of our lives and it just look like disconnected dots uh, of a random deity who seems to have no design and no pattern and no sense of color or style or art. Mm -hmm. um, part of that though is where um, we have to recognize we have a difference in perspective, that God is God and we're not. And so uh, this is where I believe the writer of Proverbs uh, is wise in telling us to trust in the Lord of all our heart and not rely on our own insight or mm -hmm. our own eyesight. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge Him in all things. He will make straight our paths. Um, th this is a totally legitimate, totally honest question, but I really think the answer is somewhat simple. And that is, I think we're, we're not looking carefully enough or we're not able to see uh, carefully enough that there's a much, much bigger story here than the story that we are aware of. Mm -hmm. And so when I think I haven't been blessed or I haven't, you know, God isn't done anything for me, um, then, then I'm, I'm really not looking carefully enough. Yeah, it, it, it can just be hard as, as a Christian to to find that perspective that, yeah. that God sees rather than kind of almost the, the narrow sight that we see. But God sure. has so much bigger of, a, of an eyesight than we do. That's right. That's right. I, I, like, the way, uh, I like the way Habakkuk uh, puts it. You know, um, in chapter 3, I actually had, had intended to read this passage today, but I just didn't have time. But I think he really, he really captures this idea. He says in chapter 3, verse 17, that, to 19, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Now, you know, to us, that doesn't sound like a big catastrophe. I mean, I'm going, well, you know, I'm not really too uptight about my olives and my <laughs> flocks and stuff. But in their world, this is like, this is like, you're, you're in deep taffy. Mm -hmm. You know, none of that stuff. He says in verse 18, yet, yet, in other words, despite the image that I see, I believe there is a bigger part to the picture, yeah. yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And, and that's where also I think Habakkuk reminds us that, that joy is not just an emotion that happens or overwhelms, it is a choice. Mm. Paul talks about this in Philippians, in whatever situation I'm in, I have learned therein to be content. I know mm -hmm. how to be abased, I know how to abound. I've had good times, I've had bad times, mm -hmm. but I've learned. And this is, this is what Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice and take joy in the God of my salvation. Now, notice in that phrase, he says, take jo joy in the God of my salvation. Not take joy because my crops are doing great, mm -hmm. because my flocks are all, uh, cool and they're here and and because my olives are like jamming it's no none of that stuff's happening mm -hmm. i'm taking joy in the god of my salvation and then he goes on to say in the last verse god the lord is my strength he makes my feet like the deers he makes me tread on my high places i think it, it is hard mm -hmm. uh, nobody's disputing that and i and i think um that god our loving gracious father even recognizes when we struggle with this. I mean, if you you know if you read Job, he didn't just he didn't just strike Job down and say, Job, how come you're not you know happy and, and smiley? Mm -hmm. and, come on, dude, put on a happy mm -hmm. face. He he recognizes that this is hard. He made us with these emotions, but the eyes of faith see um, that which isn't there, and that's why the writer of Hebrews says, you know, faith is the is seeing those things that are that are not there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's believing in that which is unseen. So yeah, that, that I think is the struggle in hard times. And, and every single one of us could have asked that question 
we do ask it at times. Yeah, I definitely 100% agree. Yeah, uh, I think there's a there's a common phrase that a lot of us know of the the fake it till you make it. And I think is when we when we think of uh, mm-hmm. rejoicing in the midst of sadness and hardship, um, I think we think a lot of times of okay, how do I get there though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I'm, that's, that's a good question because because. Um, what I'm not talking about here, I mean, today I talked about faithful laughter. What I'm not talking about is some sort of trite, giddy, mm-hmm. uh, dishonest uh, joy. Um, first of all, the scripture takes very, very seriously uh, grief and sadness. I mean, there's a whole section of Psalms or a whole, whole type of Psalms called lament. Lam- and we have a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is not a God that's obsessed with, you know, happy, trappy, uh, you know, little smiley faces mm-hmm. on our faith. Having said that, um, uh, I don't think God wants us to fake it, that, that your job is not to kind of walk around, say, oh my gosh, yeah. my mom has cancer, I love it. It's not that. It's more recognizing at a deeper level, at a much more mature type of happiness, at a much deeper and richer type of laughter that says, I don't know what's going on here, and it hurts, and I don't like it, and I wish it weren't this way, but here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. I know that the Lord is my strength. Mm -hmm. I know that that, that I can rejoice in Him, that He loves me, and that there is a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And so... um, Am I, am I still feeling some grief? Uh, yeah, definitely. But at the same time, for me to say I'm going to rejoice or for me to not uh, go around and sort of live out this, uh, this you know, universal pity party, feel bad for me, I'm really, you know, is, is not, it's basically saying, look, I realize there's, a, there's an untruth, there's a fakery involved in acting like God's not at work. That's mm-hmm. also not honest. That's yeah. also not true. And so it's trying to be true to what I know. Um, you go, but well, what if my heart's not in it? Well, well, one of the ways I think that we think about that is, first of all, I recognize our hearts are deceitful. Yeah. Uh, our hearts are not into a lot of stuff God says to do. Our hearts are not into vegetables. Our hearts are not, all of us, into exercise. Our hearts are, are not into always, uh, you know, maybe when you're a little kid, into bathing. You don't say, oh, if mm-hmm. your heart's not in it, don't do it. <laughs> you know, so I'm not going to run yeah. on my heart. Yeah. But I also think there's a sense in which um, that my life trains my heart. My head trains my heart. My activities train my heart. That um, that in some ways we think of laughter. We think joy is just kind of, oh, my gosh, you see that cat video? Joy is an acquired taste. It's an acquired, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a discipline. Mm-hmm. And so to act on that is not fakery to act on that is is discipline in the same way that uh, if I see someone uh, if I see someone that, that needs help but they're not attractive to me they smell bad they whatever uh, I'm saying you know what? I just don't feel like really helping them Jesus says oh well, if you don't feel like it steer clear no you you act on it but perhaps you will discover that if you act on that consistently you will begin to develop a heart of love for those mm-hmm. people or for that person um, and that you can have the heart of Christ. So so I don't like the phrase, fake it till you make it. I'm not suggesting that people fake it. I am saying, I am saying, lean in, act. Act mm-hmm. your way into a way of feeling. Don't try to wait until you feel yourself in a way of acting. That is so good. Act into a way of feeling. I love that. Well, Duffy, uh, we love having you here. It's always a treat. Uh, and so thank you for, for being a faith Thanks, Kyle. Coach. Excited yeah. about your work, too, with young adults. That's, that's fantastic, man. Yeah, it's fun to see the Lord working all over. Cool. So, and thank you for joining us at Postscript. Uh, we'll see you in the new year. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.